you know, to me, leadership is getting people to do what I need them to do or what the company needs them to do because they want to do it. And that sounds contrived, uh, but at the end of the day, what we're trying to do as leaders is motivate people, energize people, get them to rally around a cause, right, that is shared. And that's what's best for the company, but because they want to be part of this thing, right? And that's whether you're leading a sales team, that's whether you're leading a a, a, a core development team at SAP, and that's whether you're leading a, an eighth grade baseball team, by the way. I mean, it's all the same. Getting people to do what you need them to do because they want to do it is all about that, that inner motivation. And, as, and, and the best leaders understand how different individuals are motivated, right? What gets them energized? Because they're all different. Welcome to the Follow My Lead podcast, where we transfer stories and best practices of today's leaders to the leaders of tomorrow with your host, John Eads. Welcome to another episode of the Follow Molly Podcast. I'm your host, John Eads. You can find me on social media at John G. Eads. And today we're joined by a real New Yorker. Bob Skay has over 25 years of executive business experience. He's currently the head of the Americas for Dun & Bradstreet, overseeing $1.2 billion in revenue and hundreds of sales and service professionals. I originally met Bob when he was with Interactive Data Corporation when he was the North American VP of Sales. He just has tremendous experience from very large companies all the way to startup software companies. It was just too much. He has too much knowledge not to dig into and pass on to you. So I was really excited that he agreed to be on the show. We touched on a lot of things, including why having your own leadership style is so important. Uh, where, what his definition of leadership is and where it came from, uh, what people are really motivated by and why each person needs to be motivated by different things. He talked about four ways to stand out as a professional. He went into detail about each one. I thought it was really a, an insightful point, and so we cover those in, in great detail. So I think you're going to love this show. He's a really, really exceptional businessman, father, husband. He touched on his family, just a lot of good stuff. So without further ado, Here's my conversation with Bob Skay. Just a quick housekeeping item. This podcast is brought to you by LearnLoft, a professional development company focused on providing education that delivers value for the modern professional. Check out their online leadership programs, blogs, resources, and podcasts at LearnLoft.com. Their brand new 10-day leadership challenge program is set to be released this week filled with leadership videos, challenges, and social interactions to help you become a better leader in just 10 days. Well, Bob, thanks for being on the show. You bet, John. Good to hear from you again. Well, it's, you know, for people that don't know Bob Skay or anything about Dun & Bradstreet, what is, just give the audience a little taste of who you are, how old you are, where you live, a little bit of your personal life, just so they get a little little, little flavor of who you are. Sure. So, uh, you know, from the Northeast originally and uh, the New York area, actually, and uh, uh, Jersey City, in fact. A very uh, very urban thing, so I consider myself a bit of a New Yorker, and um, uh, grew up in a big family in the city, and uh, went to Rutgers uh, University in Newark, uh, and uh, jumped over to Manhattan and started working with Chase Manhattan pretty early, uh, and spent 15 or 16 years there, and have jumped around a couple of spots since, but most of my, uh, my professional career has been in uh, financial services, uh, data analytics, and technology. Uh, 15 years at Chase and joined a research company called Multex, which was then acquired by Reuters. Um, and uh, after Reuters, I ran a, a I went out and ran a small startup, not unlike what you're doing <clears throat> in the uh, wealth management space. It was a true software company called Northstar. I spent about five years there running the company. Uh, ultimately, uh, we sold that off to SEI and uh, joined uh, Interactive Data back in the financial services information space. And uh, now with Dun & Bradstreet. So uh, flip some calendars, as you can hear, but kind of a range of experiences on the professional side from, you know, big, uh, big chunky bank in Chase where I spent 15 years and got a lot of my formative fundamental training. We talk more about that and, and then jumped around to startups. You know, Multex was a startup. You know, we grew that to $80 million and, and sold it. And then I, then I went to, to Reuters, a larger company, then back to a, relative, you know, million-dollar startup, stayed there for five years. So 
it's kind of combination big and small, uh, and but primarily in financial services. Dun and Bradstreet's really in the you know kind of corporate information, commercial information space. Um, on a personal front, um, I uh, I have four kids. I live out in New Jersey, about 15 miles from the office here, um, and uh, married for 25 years to my wife Lori, and uh, and and uh, two dogs. I have. Uh, uh, one son just graduated college and moved out to Manhattan already, so got him off the payroll. That's good. Uh, <laughs> got uh, two in college uh, right now, uh, and uh, and a rising senior in in high school. So next year, I for the second time, I'll have three in college at the same time, which isn't exactly what, the way you'd want to plan it. But there we go. So well, that's, uh, that's kind of it. The sounds like work. it sounds like mm-hmm. you're you, you've done a, a lot of great things, both professionally and certainly personally. Four kids, twenty five year marriage. Two dogs. I mean, you've 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 kind of modeled what many young professionals um, would love to have. And so, but the very first time I met you, Bob, in person, uh, I was sitting in a classroom getting ready to do some sales training, and you got up in front of thirty, forty people, and you just owned this room like I had never seen. It was just like the people's eyes were just glued to you ears were open it was just something it was one of these memories that i'll never forget that just the people that were just just so interested in what you have to say where where did that come from and how could a young professional or any professional maybe learn from some of those things that that you do so well in front of a room well thank you john i mean uh, that's that's quite a compliment i didn't realize they were even listening at the time <laughs> Uh, but thanks. You know, you know, I th- I think it's a matter of uh, you know I'm I'm running sales now. I've I've done some other things. I've run marketing. I actually ran a software company. So I've run development. I've run marketing. I've done some you know kind of strategy work as well. But my core is client facing, and I think the key there, you know, is 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 the fact that your audience, at least in that situation, that that situation was where your your company was going to train my sales leaders, um, it's a matter of authenticity, I think. And there's so much of that involved in leadership today. It, it's critical, right? And what do I mean by authentic, authentic authenticity? It's it's that they see you as one of them, that they see you as someone that, that has their best interests in mind. Um, and also we'll get in the trenches with you, and that develops a level of trust. Uh, and so when, you, when you're able to develop that, and uh, you can build that sense of camaraderie, in particular in a, in a client-facing organization, whether it's sales or service or biz dev or pre-sales, post-sales, uh, when you come in with that credibility, authenticity, you build that trust, and that, that allows for really candid dialogue. And so... Um, you know, I, I don't. Rec- I, I do recall that day. I don't recall them being glued or anything, but, <laughs> but I do know that when when I feel at my best, I am feeling a connection to my audience that is genuine and authentic because we share a common uh, a common thread, uh, or, or 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 they realize that I've got the level of credibility in terms of what I'm speaking about. Was there someone in your professional journey that that taught you that did that come from experience did it come from reading where did you learn that that sense of authenticity and how important it was to kind of sit in their chair in a sense you know let me let me say this I, I, I'll answer your question after I say this when I was a young professional you know first of all I spent 15 years at Chase as I mentioned Chase had fantastic training uh, there used to be a a flippant uh, per- perception on the street that Chase would uh, train the best and keep the rest. Um, but their their training was excellent, and I went through a lot of professional development there. The Center for Creative Leadership down in North Carolina, I went to two or three sessions there. Uh, Columbia Business School, we did leadership training there in very small settings, Harvard Negotiation Project, um, a number of different um, you know, investments in me. I, at one point, I had a personal coach uh, at a very early age, about 30, 31, 32, 33. And I'll tell you, that's invaluable. So there's no substitute for that type of thing. And to this day, I thank what is now J.P. Morgan Chase for that investment because most of what I know in terms of my fundament, 
fundamental foundational leadership style is born of a lot of that training and information. But I will say this, that, you know, around that time and before that time, this concept and notion of leadership I found to be very elusive. And I remember sitting down with, and I still have the recording, with like a two-hour session with one of the executive um, coaches, and uh, I remember talking openly about what is this ethereal concept of leadership, right? Can we nail it down? Can we pin it down? I'm kind of a black and white. My dad was an engineer, and I try to like really look at process and workflow and be able to pinpoint things statistically measured, and and it was just always it always felt outside my grasp. And then over years of working with people and developing, I, I kind of become I became comfortable with a leadership style that I feel suits me well and has worked for me. And there are many different leadership styles. But I, I, I point that out, John, only to say that early in one's career, to the extent someone's listening in, if you're thinking, geez, what is this thing? I can't grasp it. It's too ethereal for me, too uh, ambiguous and vague. You know what? It kind of comes about, and I think it ultimately comes about by, by understanding what your true leadership style is, what your inner style is. So, um that, that's kind of my, my, my preface to all this. You know, the, the people and folks in my life, there have been many in my professional life that, uh, that have helped me along the way. There was someone in particular at Chase who is now retired. His name is Bill Gary. Uh, he'd blush if you heard me talking about him. But he was the first one to show me that, you know, building trust and being one of us is really important because I would have run, run through a wall for that guy, you know. Right. And he kind of he picked me out and said, you know, you're someone we want to invest in. I remember I was going to uh, chase a lot of opportunities, and I was going to move to Singapore uh, at one point, and it didn't work out because Chase and Chemical merged. And then I was going to move to Atlanta, believe it or not, an area you're familiar with, because I had a southeast territory. And, you know, Bill said to me, and I'll never forget, uh, he said, look, if you want to go down there, I'll support you. I will. Uh, but let's make no mistake, it's not a strategic outpost for Chase Manhattan Bank, and I'll probably lose you to Nations Bank. So if you want to if you want to do that, go ahead. But, you know, ultimately, you know, we can talk about your career here. And that was the beginning, and that was probably 1994, uh, which makes me older than electricity, of course. <laughs> but, but, but we then had a conversation about my leading the, the uh, professional services, excuse me, uh, the financial services team, at Chase, and that was my first managerial job in 1994, 95, uh, and it took off from there. And so I really credit Bill with that first conversation around what do you want to do. Uh, and and um, you know, I would have loved to have been in Atlanta, but you know, it's one of those uh, sliding doors types of things where if that door had opened, my career would have been very different. Instead, I stayed in New York and with Chase, and my career took off, and and, and here I am. So what's the uh, you just mentioned about ninety four, ninety five. You get your first role thanks to someone, thanks to a mentor and someone that had, you know, really your best interest in mind. What was the, if there's something that you could think back to that first managerial role, what was probably what was the hardest thing about managing people? Well, you know, I think the hardest thing in that first role is understanding how to stop doing and start coaching. And, you know, we all feel, you know, I was a pretty successful sales rep prior to that. And so the hardest thing for me to be very candid and very specific was being in front of a client with my rep or with my team and not taking over that call <laughs> <laughs> because I know I can do it better than them. And so allowing people to grow um, is, and understanding that you have to nurture and allow people to grow and coach and give the right types of feedback um, is, is, is the real kind of growth in there, right? Understanding you're no longer an individual contributor and doer. You've got to let go of the range a little bit and, you know, let them, let them scrape their knees once in a while in, in, in low-risk settings, by the way. Right. Um, and, and and then they can develop. I think that was the, the hardest thing for me initially uh, was was learning how to throttle back a little bit. What about what about now? Right? I mean, really experienced. You've managed thousands of people now in your career in different roles, different types of people. 
Um, is it any different now, those challenges, than they were at that 94, 95 range when you were, you know, you first put that, that um, put people underneath you? Yeah, it, it definitely different. Uh, obviously, you get comfortable with that letting go. Um, one of the one of the biggest challenges now, I have hundreds of folks around the country, Latin America, and um, one of the biggest challenges now is uh, making sure that the communication uh, gets through to everyone. Um, in the way that I want, it, it, it's a it's an issue of scale now, right? And so you mentioned at the beginning of the call where I was in a room of 30 people and I was able to articulate exactly my vision for where we were, where we wanted to go, why we were doing this thing, and I had a level of credibility there. That's harder to do remotely, and I can't reach 800 people eye to eye all the time. And so the hardest thing for me now, actually, as we here at Dun and Bradstreet start to modernize the culture and be forward-leaning and client-facing and, and all of those things, uh, the hardest thing now is, is, is getting that communication out, getting it consistently into the hands of those who are federated, right? They're all over the country. Some of the, you know, 30% of my folks work from home um, and making sure that communication happens. So the challenges and the issues are different. Of course, versus 94 when I was the first-level sales manager in, in a big business, um, you know, now there's there's you have to manage, uh, you know, up as well and across, and there's a lot of perception and, um, of course, board level information, and the, the stakes are much much higher. Uh, that's 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 an obvious dimension that changes. But at its uh, very but, it's, but at its very core, it sounds like some of the modalities are ensuring that that many people that live across the the country or the world get get that same purpose mission vision all those things that I heard in that room that day that at its very core though it remains the same those those things are really important that they understand the vision and know where you're trying to go and buy into it so it just it brings different challenges but it at its core it's still getting people moving in the same direction and inspiring them to take action is that right that's right that, that's correct. I mean, you know, the, the fundamentals of leadership don't change. The scale and scope and stakes, <laughs> and frankly, the risk changes. Right. Um, but but you're right. It's the same. I mean, look, my my favorite definition of leadership, and I heard this many years ago. Uh, I think it was at the Columbia uh, leadership training. It, it, it and it sounds a little crude, but if you really break it down, uh, it, it makes sense. It you know, to me, leadership is getting people to do what I need them to do or what the company needs them to do because they want to do it. And that sounds contrived, uh, but at the end of the day, what we're trying to do as leaders is motivate people, energize people, get them to rally around a cause, right, that is shared. And that's what's best for the company, but because they want to be part of this thing, right? And that's whether you're leading a sales team, that's whether you're leading a a, a, a core development team at SAP, and that's whether you're leading a, an eighth grade baseball team, by the way. I mean, it's all the same. Getting people to do what you need them to do because they want to do it is all about that, that inner motivation. And, as, and, and the best leaders understand how different individuals are motivated, right? What gets them energized? Because they're all different. And, you know, I'm fond of saying that, you know, managing at every level, leading at every level is not very different. I'm a basketball guy from, from managing, from, from coaching a sixth grade basketball team, you know. You know, Jane has different skills than Jill and has different skills from, from Jimmy and Joey, and, and, and they're in a different place. And getting them to contribute to the team and feel part of that is really important. It's really no difference, different in business, although at a different level, getting folks energized, engaged, and motivated and, and as leaders, that's what we're charged with doing. Making well, I'm sure gonna, we get I got to ask you a tough question now. I, I just have yep. to do it. Is is it okay in the professional world that 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 purpose that you're getting people motivated by is it okay that it's money, or does it need to be something else? Well, I think you know if you if you read about it, that's a great question. But if you if you read about motivation and incentive, ultimately money doesn't work. Um, and at, at, it, it's important. It's there. It's jacks are better. People want to be paid a fair wage no matter what, and they want to be rewarded for their contribution, period, full stop. So it's kind of jacks are better. 
at the end of the day, the differential, with people being motivated or not, is acknowledgement and learning and training and development. You know, we're taking a group of folks now who I consider to be, for lack of a better term, our high potential, uh, you know, leaders of today who can take my role potentially down the road, down the road when I get hit by, you know, the per- proverbial bus or <laughs> I like to think of hitting, hitting the lottery maybe. Uh, uh, but when I check out and, and, and training and developing those people is not about money. What, what we're giving them is access to certain types of speakers and leadership and training and group settings and different experiences uh, that will allow them to grow in professional ways and it's not only all business either. It's it's a personal thing, you know. Our 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 CEO here, Bob Carrigan, who's a very progressive digital uh, leader, uh, you know, from the publishing industry initially, has brought in something called the CEO Leadership Experience, which has as much to do with sustainable high performance and and bringing our best selves every day as it does understanding our data, right? Yeah, uh, and so I think I think ultimately, good question. But ultimately, you know, money jacks are better, and and your comp plan and incentive programs uh, are are critical. They are behavior modification, but they're kind of base and fundamental. I think people get mostly motivated and energized, in my experience, by making sure they understand how how they're appreciated, understanding what their role is, what the vision is, clear, open, candid, trusting communication, right? And then when we can invest in them and show that we care about them, you're going to build an environment where people are highly motivated. That's our goal. Yeah, Bob, how do you get the oh, – first of all, it's a fantastic – I mean, even the vision of your CEO and investing in people, I mean, it's just it, – it is really next generation in a way. Now, the question that I've battled or struggled with is, you know, the next quarter is – double is more important than the last quarter and you know this year is more important than the last year how do you as a leader and you know certainly from an executive leadership standpoint keep your keep your focus on both the short-term results but have that long-term vision of the development of people i mean and how 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 hard is that for you yeah and that's the right question absolutely um because it is, you know, we are a publicly traded company and, uh, you know, our financial performance is critical. And I, you know, I, I have a big percentage, a large percentage of the overall company uh, under my remit. And uh, it's really important. I think, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the selling function in particular, you know, no one will be surprised that performance is really important. I, I think to a man, to a woman, and then organizationally, uh, you know, we talk about what the stakes are, what the goals are, what we're trying to achieve, all the while we're caring about that person individually, right? And it's kind of, you know, we're, we're here on the, uh, during, during the Olympics, right, in, in Rio, and it, you're probably watching, and I'm watching a little bit. I watched last night. It's always amazing to me <clears throat> and, and somewhat heartbreaking at times when I was watching the uneven bars last night and this you know, girl from, I don't know, I think she was from Russia or something, uh, you know, she she fell off the bar and and she went back up and they you know, the announcers were saying it's very uncommon, very uncharacteristic for her. Um, and then she you know she got back up, she finished her. She's obviously tremendously disappointed. She's worked four years for that moment and it all comes to that and she just slipped. And she came off that stage and walked over and her coach came up and hugged her. You know, so I don't want to get too schmaltzy here, but I thought in that moment was that the you know. As long as people are giving you everything they've got, right? As, as long as they are leaving it all on the field, right? Um, um, you know, when things don't break their way, you, you try to think through what we could have done differently. Make it a learning moment. Make it a coaching moment, and then you move, and then you charge forward, right? And so, you know, results are critically important. There's no question. You know, I, I often say my job is like coaching the Knicks, right? It doesn't matter if you're going to the Hall of Fame, man. You got to win games, right? So uh, um, we, they're not we winning to, many games right now, though, Bob. <laughs> I know, which is why the coach keeps getting fired. By the way, <laughs> no, it's a really <laughs> brilliant example, right? I mean, these 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 athletes train four years for something, and in 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 a moment, it's either glory or pure disappointment. And to see the the um, their coach have to hug or lift up or you know 
cry with them, right? I mean, when some of these Americans won, I mean, just pure tears of joy. It, it's it's real life, and it happens every day in the professional world. And so um, it, it's a really great example. Uh, let's move on to a little, a little bit something. What advice would you give a young professional that has a desire to lead others professionally? What are some of the specific things that you look for or that you did look for in this group of what you called high performers? Yeah, I, I would say that, um, uh, you know, there's certain things that I look for when I, when I work with others. Um, uh, one is really just a, a, you know, a natural, um, kind of, kind of a natural, um, uh, work ethic <clears throat> around what you're trying to get done. So that, that to me, that comes through first, right? The second one is is an ability to connect with others. You know that emotional quotient. There are plenty of really really smart people that I've worked with over the years that are just fantastic. Um, um, <clears throat> you know, business people and even business leaders that that may not have the ability to get to a certain level because they don't have the emotional quotient to do that. So I look for that as well. So I look for that work ethic. You got to be smart, and then the emotional quotient of being able to connect with people. Um, after that, it's really about being in the detail. Um, <clears throat> you know, from a leadership perspective, and I learned this from someone some years ago, um, and that was the feedback I consistently got from various coaches and leaders is that I needed to be more into the detail, and I learned that the hard way. Um, but it's so important. Truly understand the business because that gives a level of credibility to those you would lead. Right? What would be when an example? What would be an example of the details? I mean, I mean, I have I have an idea in my mind, but I'm curious. Just you know, something that comes to mind in in your world where you didn't worry about the details enough early on, and then you learned to um, pay attention to them later because you understood how important it was. Yeah, so, you know, most of this comes from my chase days, but, uh, you know, early on, I didn't understand certain aspects of how our business worked. Uh, you know, certain product lines and or technologies and or how the financial aspect of it worked, right? So when I got into settings, either with people that reported to me or with people that were senior to me, my boss and his boss and her boss and um, you know, if I didn't have that level of knowledge, I was either exposed uh, meeting with with leaders, uh, uh, me- meeting with executive management above me, in a setting where I didn't want to be exposed because I hadn't done my homework well enough. Or you can recover from that, by the way. Or even worse, being with the people that report to me and not truly understanding what they do, or what their struggles are, or what's challenging to them, or asking them how you can help them. Um, and so coming in in, at a high level and being a little naive to what's happening on the ground with the people in the field, with the people that report to you, that's harder to recover from, to be honest. Yeah. I I think of a, I think of a, a personal story when you just said that I, I didn't understand how revenue was recognized. You know, when just because revenue was booked doesn't mean it can be recognized from a tax perspective till maybe two, three, four quarters later. And I'll never forget sitting in an executive meeting in my prior my prior company in a board meeting, and I was the only guy in the room that didn't know it, right? And uh, it it put me at a significant disadvantage. And so I think that's just a real life example of you know, how revenue is booked is, is something in the details that you just have to know um, when you get up into the, the upper ranks. And so it sounds like you probably had some similar experiences through your career. Yeah, no question. And that's one in particular, right? I ran a software company for a while. The various revenue recognition policies in software are different from other businesses I had been in. I wasn't quite aware. And there were a couple of times when I was caught off guard. <laughs> um, you know, it, um, uh, understanding, you know, the way the products and, and and the way your organization intertwines and who delivers what for whom. So getting into conversations and things that I should know and I didn't know. 
Yeah. Um, there, was, there was one time where a specific partner was put on the table, and I wasn't aware who that partner was, and I knew I should have known who that partner was. I couldn't engage in that conversation. I was asked a question. I didn't know. So you know, do your homework uh, is, is definitely important. But the last thing to your question I'd say is uh, the sphere of influence. I think people underestimate this, and it's something I call uh, a sphere of influence, and I, and I coach a lot of people internally and externally on this notion. And, and that is, you know, back in the day, they might call this politics. Um, I think that has a really negative connotation. I think ultimately, if you want to be a leader, you have to, you have to broaden your sphere as relates to those who you can influence and can help you influence. And so literally putting that to you know, for anyone listening in who's, you know, one of, the, one of the most important things that I've done is every six months or so, I will literally document in the, in a, on a piece, one piece of paper, concentric circles, you know, the, the inner circle is me, and, and listing out people in the organization that I need to get closer to, I need to develop a stronger relationship with, I need to understand their business better in order to succeed, in order to accomplish what I need to accomplish. And when you put it to paper, it, it, it is revealing and telling. I think whenever you write something down, it, it does better than, you know, it does more for you than just having it in your head. But what's interesting to see is that it's not, this is not a how do I get to the CEO thing or how do I manage up thing. Uh, it's a who do I really need. And, and most often it ends up being a peer uh, across the organization with whom I need to focus on in the next three to six months to accomplish what we need to accomplish together. And mine, you know, it's funny, if you look at mine now, you know, our CEO is Bob Carrigan. I have great access to Bob. He's a great guy. But almost at this, I, I score them, by the way. If you're in the circle, you're a 90. As you go out, the concentric circles, you're a 70, you're a 60, you're a 50. Um, uh, the same, you know, CEO Carrigan, you know, might have the same score as the interns that were here this summer, those 30 or 40 people that I want to invest in and I want them to come back and work for us next year. So this is not a seniority thing so much as a uh, kind of prioritization and impact of where I need to spend my time. So the sphere of influence thing I think is very important. People underestimate it and certainly probably don't give it enough uh, kind of formal attention. Yeah, well, it's a great example. Um, I'm, I'm going to start using that. Can I steal that? Yeah, man. <laughs> Well, it, let's end on some fun stuff here. The um, it's one of my favorite questions to ask, and that is, what's harder, leading at home or leading at the office? You mentioned four kids. You mentioned twenty-five year marriage. You mentioned two dogs. What's what's harder, leading eight hundred people or or leading at home? Yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, it is it is undoubtedly at home. I, I literally just had this conversation with my. Uh, head of uh, sales operations, Russ Pastina, just before this call, we were talking this morning and, uh, you know, we we're talking about our weekends and, and what it's like there at home. And you just, I just don't get the same deferential treatment at home that I do here. So, uh, you know, I, I, uh, you, you don't, you know, because, because the familiarity is there and for the whole reason. So leading at home uh, is, is fun, but I don't know that I am the leader at home. I, I, what I say is I, I generally have veto authority and I'm a heavy influencer, but I try not to make the rules at home. I understand. Well, you know, it's one of these things that I, you know, with two young kids, I think about a lot the responsibility that that I have as a man to to ensure that, you know, my kids um, make good just good decisions when they get – when the decisions really matter, right? Um, when they get – you have three in college. You know, when they – when they take their kid, when you take your youngest to college or, or the, the, the last one to college, are you confident that you've done a good enough job as a, as a father, a husband, to, that they're going to be equipped to make the best decisions that they can? And I think it's a, there's just a different dynamic. You have that at work too. You want people to make good decisions and take action. And it's just an interesting de decision. I would say nine out of 10 people say it's harder leading at home. So I, I think we're almost to a consensus here. Yeah, and, you know, it's because most we don't get that <clears throat> kind of, we don't have the, the, the status and the deferential treatment. But, you know, my goal, uh, my goal as a, as, a, as a father in particular is to, you know, to, to raise, you know, it's a very competitive world out there. You know, in Northeast where I'm from, it's, 
it's intense and uh, all I want to produce is productive members of society with a strong moral compass and uh, if we can do that, I, I think we've, we've done our job. So, uh, well yeah, the, said. The home, Very well you said. Know, the, you know, the, 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 what, the one thing I would point out, John, it's really important, different today from way back when, you know, when I was leading, the, the bleed over of personal self to professional self is so much more prevalent right now, right? I, you know, the, the, the ubiquitous nature of data information, our iPhones, you probably juggle both professional and personal interactively during the day, intertwined during the day. <clears throat> and so there's more of an opportunity for us as at our personal lives to be present in our professional lives. Um, and it's a, very, it's a very interesting dynamic vis-a-vis -vis when we were you know, when I was, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was a very separate thing. Now it's being embraced that you bring your personal self to your professional life. And, and younger folks understand that because, you know, my son's doing his homework literally on his phone, something I've never dreamed of, but their life is very virtual and on the move. And, you know, the schoolwork and professional and personal life intertwined. I think that's a real dimension, you know, a new dimension to professional leadership that is intertwining your personal self and having your personal self show up in your in your professional life. And I think people respect that, and that's part of what we're doing here at D&B. It's a very kind of personal leadership style. Uh, and, and so the home and the office life couldn't be more different in terms of the empowerment I have, but uh, but it's very relevant to, to, to make sure that we're balancing both of those and embracing both of those. Well, it's it, you're spot on. And it, it flips the other way too. I mean, right, the young professional – has to be very keen about the what they share and how they share it and and how much access they give and you know that stuff's there forever even the stuff that disappears can be screenshot i mean it it goes it flips both ways right um i think it's really important that the the leader shows their personal cards and shows some of what they their personal life um, but on the flip side, I think young professionals have to be very aware of their their personal decisions and how it can impact them professionally. And so um, I really appreciate you bringing that up. Let's end on the last question. If you could have dinner with three leaders, living or dead, who would those three people be? Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to uh... – <laughs> It's hard to answer this without being a bit cliche because, you know, you probably won't hear any answer from me that you haven't heard before, so I'll try to be a little different. I mean, the ones that come to mind are uh, Churchill and Lincoln. I just have so much respect for for Lincoln in particular. You know, I do a lot of reading around that period of time. Um, so I, I just read a book called The Immortal Irishman. Uh, I just finished it. Uh, and by the way, I'm trying to always read two books, one on the personal front and one on the business front, right, at the same time to, to balance it out. But uh, there's a guy called Thomas Marr who, uh, uh, who was an Irishman who came over and led uh, in the United States here and has a, just an amazing story and what an interesting conversation that would be. Spoke five languages in 1860 from Waterford, England, uh, Fort Waterford, Ireland, and you know became an army general and was a governor of Wisconsin and you know, et cetera, et cetera, goes on and on. And, and the Fighting Irish comes from his battalion, the 69th Battalion in New what's, York. And what's it, what's the book really called again? The Immortal Irishman uh, awesome. is, is really good. I just finished it. So Thomas Marr would be uh, someone. But you know what? I'm also a big uh, I'm a music guy, a musician. I was in bands growing up. I play a little guitar, I sing. And, you know, uh, I have lots of kind of uh, favorite favorite artists. And I was, you know, I will confess I was a big deadhead. And I'm just reading a book on Jerry Garcia. And I'd love to have lunch with Jerry Garcia. So, um, oh, you it's know, a great, it's a fan. very, it's a very eclectic group, Bob. You got, yeah. You well, know, I'm an eclectic guy. Thomas you know. Moore and, and Abe Lincoln. Exactly, exactly. I was trying to give you something that you wouldn't get otherwise. But if you looked at my, uh, you know, my music collection, you'd see how eclectic I am. So, uh, I think that's it. I think, I, I think I'd probably want a, a broad spectrum of uh, of leaders. You know, maybe throw Tom Coughlin in there because I'm a big Giants fan. I hear you. Well, hey, I really appreciate such great ideas and insight and experience. Um, it's just you, you're a you're a great model. I'm so happy you came on the show, and so uh, we look forward to having you again soon. And we'll make sure to put all this stuff in the show notes. Certainly, send people to the right places in terms of Dun Brad Street and and where people can find you. So, thank you so much for being here. Fantastic. Thank you, John. I appreciate the time. 
I hope you enjoyed another episode of the Follow My Lead podcast. It's a real pleasure and honor to bring you stories and best practices to help you perform better at work and at home. If you enjoyed the episode, it would mean a lot to us if you'd go over and write a review and recommendation on iTunes or wherever you listen to the show. It's a real pleasure to get to do this every week, so it means a lot. I get to read all of them. So until next time, remember the world needs more leaders, not less.